Today the words of God come to us in love. Today the word today the word of God comes to us in faith. Today the word of God comes to us in hope. Loving Lord, you have showered your world with faith, hope, and love. We come, we come seeking, O oh God, peering toward you through, peering toward you through, we, though we only see dimly, listening though we only understand, though we, <laughs> though we understand only partly, learning slowly though we are already fully known. Help us to be faithful to you, to offer hope to those in need, and to love all your children. Make us present to the fullness of your kingdom today that we may surrender our illusion of control and find ourselves grounded in your love. Whether we have the gift of beautiful speech, or the gift of understanding and knowledge, or the gift of faith, or generosity, or any, of, or any other good thing, if we do not love, even our most precious talents are as nothing. And if we believe love to be only a feeling or a thought, still we miss the truth. Before God, with the people of God, let us confess the ways we have fallen short of God's love. Let us pray.
My friends, God is love. Love that withstands all things, even the worst we can do. God is love. Love that believes all things, even the unbelievable. God is love. <clears throat> love that endures all things, even to the end of the age. And this love is for you. This love surrounds you. This love is in you. Live in love and be at peace, knowing that you are forgiven. We know that faith, hope, and love abide. And let us share this wondrous gift as we pass the peace of Christ this day. The peace of Christ be with you all. Glory to God. All right, do I have some young at heart? I know I have a lot of young at heart. How about young in age? They come in! All right. Coming in hot. All oh, love you all. All right, I want to read you guys a story today. Why is there a robot? Oh, why is there a robot? I love this robot. I want to read you the story about a robot today. The robot's name is Z. Yes, yeah, Z. That's it. Uh-huh. On a bright and chilly day, Z went out looking for adventure and stumbled upon a piece of half-buried treasure. What does that look like? A bottle. A bottle. Right. Inside the bottle was a message. Too smudgy to read, except for the two words at the very bottom. What does that say? I don't know. Love Beatrice, yes. The young robot did not know what love meant or who Beatrice was, but they felt important. So Z tucked the treasure away and headed towards home. Whoa, all kinds of funky stuff happening here right now. Man, let's see. So as night fell, all the robots prepared to power, power down and recharge for the next day. Z asked for a bedtime story, and a nightlight, and a good night kiss. <laughs> you saw that, didn't you? Tucked snugly in bed, Z's thought drifted back to the important treasure. What is love? asked the young robot. Look at all of them. Does not compute, replied the old rusty robots. Does not make sense, they said. Then they said, sweet dreams, and they turned out all the lights. Alone in the dark, Z could not sleep. The other robots had always been able to answer Z's questions, and if they did not know what love meant, who would? Maybe there was one person. So in the morning, Z went out looking for Beatrice. Remember what the, night, the note said? Love Beatrice, right? So there he packs up and he goes. Hello, I'm looking for Beatrice, explains Z. I want to know what love is and she will have the answer. That sounds important, said the captain. 
climb aboard and we'll go on a quest. See what the boat's name is? S.S. Cat. <laughs> Catnip. It's a cat who's the captain of the boat. We'll just have to let them in. So they did. And off they traveled. Unsure of how to start a quest, Z asked around. Excuse me, are you Beatrice? What is this? Do you guys know? A beaver, an otter, yes. Are you Beatrice? He asked, who, who was this? A turtle. a turtle, right. Are you Beatrice? No. No, said a voice. What's a Beatrice? Who did he talk to? What's that thing? A scarecrow, right. We're on a quest, whoops, to find out what love is, explained Z, and Beatrice will have the answer. I don't know any Beatrice, said the crow, but to me, love is sharing your food, even when it's delicious. <laughs> that did not compute, but Z thanked the crow anyway and changed course towards a place with delicious food. The baker did not know Beatrice either, but she was happy to share what love meant to her at the breadboard. Love is when someone is patient and takes the time to teach you new things. That did not compute, but Z thanked the baker anyway and changed course to a place with teachers. Where do you guys think you went? Uh-huh. The kids at recess had a lot of thoughts about what love meant. Love is... Love is? Sweaters. Love is? Wishing, Dogs. Wishing, on a star. Wishing on a star. Love is? Lawn, Lawn gnomes. Lawn gnomes. Love, love is? A million puppies. Love is? Snowflakes on my tongue. Absolutely none of them computed. But Z thanked all the students anyway and had no idea what to go in search of. What if they never found Beatrice? What if love was something a robot just could not compute? Z was about to suggest that they change course toward home when they stumbled upon a good place to spend the night. Look at that. A cottage. Yes, on an island. You see that, huh? Hello, we are on a quest. Oh, never mind. Hello, I'm Beatrice, said the woman. Yeah. Look at her. Yeah, Z could not believe their luck. What are we doing out there in the cold, asked Beatrice. Looking for you, explained Z. I want to know what love is, and I thought you would have the answer. Beatrice paused to think. She thought, what did she do? What does that look Cookies. like? Cookies. And thought, what did she do there? Play chess. Play chess with them and thought some more. What's she doing there? Dance. Dancing with them, right. Love is difficult to explain, she said. It's warm and cozy and safe and you'll know it when you feel it. Z hoped she was right. It's getting late, said Beatrice. Let's get some rest. And the young robot was preparing to power down and recharge for the next day when the old rusty robots arrived unannounced. Z, you were gone. We were worried. Look how worried they look. Yeah. And then, but we found you. And we brought your favorite bedtime story, just like in the beginning, right? And your nightlight, just like in the beginning, right? Yeah. And a good night kiss. <laughs> and that's right. Tucked snugly in bed, Z felt warm. And? And safe. It was a feeling the young robot had felt many times before. But now it had a name. What do you guys think that name Love. is? There we go. Love. Wait, what is it? Wait, what is this name? Love. Love. So love is a hard thing to explain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know your parents love you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know your grandparents love you. And you know your teachers love you, right? Yeah. And your friends? Yeah. yeah. 
because we just hold on a second because we just know that and God loves us just that same way we don't always hear it but we know right because God takes care of all of us and so we go and we go put love back in the world yes ma'am love is everything in the whole wide world that is right and we need to keep it going right can we pray Jesus, thank you so much for how much you love us and care for us. Help us to also put that love into the world in all the things we do. Amen. Thank you. You can go over if you want. Gracious and holy God, give us wisdom to recognize you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to see you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is Mark 12, 28 through 31. One of the legal as experts heard their dispute and saw how well Jesus answered them. He came over and asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is Israel, listen. Our God is the one Lord and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. No other commandment is greater than these.
So we're back with the church in Corinth today. We started with them last week, if you remember. And this is actually a really well-known passage. So let us listen this morning what the word of what the Spirit has to say of to us from the Word of God, according to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak with human elegance and angelic ecstasy, but don't have love, I'm nothing but a rusty, creaking gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and I have faith that says to a mountain jump and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything that I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, it got nowhere. So no matter what I say and what I believe and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for oneself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back. It keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Prayer in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and that we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompleteness will be canceled. We don't see things, I'm sorry. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like in any infant. But when I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We skin squinting through a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. We'll see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. This is the word of the Lord. So as far as I know, we're not doing a wedding today. But that is what most of us knows this text for, right? The older version, love is patient, love is kind. But this is the thing, a text like this that you all know so well is a nightmare to preach from because you already check out when I start reading the text because like, it's, oh, we all know all this, nothing new about it. That's why I also read it from the message today. Because maybe, maybe with a different bit of a different reading, we have a new perspective or a fresh way to look at what Paul is trying to say to us. And actually, it is to us just as much as the Corinthians. But what I want you to know is this is not the reason Paul wrote this particular chapter in his letter. Okay, Paul didn't write this for a loving couple who is about to make their promises to each other and to start their journey together. Paul wrote this letter to a church who already struggled to love, to say nothing about liking each other. That is the very same church, if you remember, that we were introduced to last week, the ones who were divided about who meant the most to them, whether it was the person that baptized them or taught them their faith or who they just liked most. They formed these factions within the church. Diverse bunch, 
and social and economic status, in ethnicity, in culture, in religion. We were trying to figure out what does it look like to be a church in the midst of their diversity, but also in a world that is so different from what the church looks like. And so the visions arose among them, and it was not just Paul and Apollos and Peter, but it was also about things like, what can you eat? What is acceptable? Circumcision versus not. There was just all these things that bubbled up for the people in this, in this church. And these things really tore at the seams of this church and started to rip them apart. And then this particular chapter follows right after Paul talks to them about we are all one body with a lot of different gifts, right? And it only works when all the gifts come together because only then is the body whole and it's all spiritual gifts. But what these folks did is went like, oh, but I can speak in tongues. I'm so much better than you are. And then someone else said, but no, I can prophesy, and that really is the thing that matters, you know? And then someone else said, but no, wait, I can heal people, and that puts me on top of the list. So even the gifts that they received are starting to pull them apart. And there was competition among them, and I think... it. it it feels to me that what mattered more to them was what the gift said to, about them rather than about what it said about God and God giving them these gifts and how they could use it to inflate themselves rather than using it for the upbuilding and the good of the community. So Paul steps in for a minute to set things straight. And this is exactly what this chapter does in the middle of all this other stuff that that Paul is talking to them about. But I couldn't help but wonder, when I was sitting with this text, what would that look like today for us, right? If Paul wrote this letter to the church today, not specifically to us, let's just put it in the church as general, but maybe, maybe even to us as Presbyterians, you know, the frozen chosen. We don't know about speaking in tongues or shall I say, religious emotion much? But we're good at doctrine and intellect and all those stuff. So what does this look like when Paul writes this? If we have the most beautiful liturgy ever designed by human beings with music from the best possible choir, but do not have love, we are a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Might that be? And if we have the most correct doctrine and wonderful theology to brag about, but we have no love, we gain nothing. And if we have a multitude of different programs and gift to all of them, but we have no love, we are nothing. If we have the most beautiful and big building with a gorgeous sanctuary and lots of space, but don't have love, we are nothing. If we offer services to all kinds of people in a high profile in the city and people are talking about our church, but we don't have love, we gain nothing. I don't know, might that be something? that might be written about the church in general today. And Paul is trying to do here is to say that none of those things make any difference if there is no love. That all of these wonderful gifts that we have, that the greater church have, the body of Christ have, it doesn't matter. Because without love, they are all hollow gifts. See, love is that force behind the gifts that actually brings transformation and wisdom and faithfulness and wholeness. Love is, in the end, the most excellent way. All gifts of faith and a call to serve, all manifestations of the Spirit, is just pale without love. So what Paul is trying to do here is he's trying to invite them, but I think definitely also us, 
to live out the quality of love that he's trying to describe in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, here's the little thing about that little word, love, right? In English, we have one word. And it feels to me that that love has been hijacked a little bit in our language today as sort of an emotion or a feeling, right? I'm in love with someone, right? It's all about feelings. Here's the thing. Paul didn't write in English. <laughs> he wrote in a language called Greek. So here's my little weirdo whatever for you again. There are four Greek words for love. One of them is eros. That's kind of what we know as the romantic love kind of deal, right? Then there's philio, which is a brotherly love. Philadelphia, how we love each other's family. Then there is surge, which is people who are you very familiar with. And then there's the fourth word, agape. And agape is the word that Paul uses when he writes this chapter. And agape, my friends, has nothing to do with emotion, not even a little bit. It is not based on affection or approval. It is completely unconditional. It's coming as a free gift, not because the beloved deserves it, but because the lover chooses to give it. Here's the thing, it is the way that God loves us. So I won't do it now, but here's a little experiment. Take this chapter 13 and go read it at home and all the places that says love, put God in there. It gives you an excellent picture of who God is. Anyway, agape is a decision or a will to act in someone else's best interest, right? like feed others, even if your food are delicious, whether we feel like it or whether we don't. It is self-sacrificing, and it always puts others first. And this love, my, my friends, is to be enacted and embodied even. It is about getting down at the supper table and taking the towel and binding it around his waist and washing his disciples' feet. This kind of love is up at dawn and it is feet on the ground and it is tools in the hand and it is a kind of working love and it builds communities and it nurtures positive social interaction, not just social networks, some of you younger ones might know exactly what I'm talking about. It's being willing to lay down your life to save people who don't even care about you. It is to view the other as someone who God created in God's image, even if you think that that image got to be a little bit blurred. Because it's the way that God loves us. It is also the way that God calls us to act towards others. And let me tell you, it ain't easy. Because if we love right, it stretches us, it takes us to places in which we are uncomfortable. And it requires much of us. Things like patience, and kindness, and endurance. It's tricky sometimes to offer them to someone like you. What if you have to offer them to the one who hates you, the person that you just plainly can't stand? And man, I had images go through my head this week that I don't want to name in good company. But it does heal, and it does forgive, and it does persevere. So I don't know about you, I can read all these beautiful words and I'm thinking, man, this is just a bunch of words. And then I'm thinking, you know, maybe Dawn is home today because she read this before and she didn't want to fight me in front of all of you, right? But, but, but Dawn can testify that when I'm, when I'm tired and when I'm stressed and when I am, had no sleep for a day or so, then I am really not doing well at loving her well. 
right? I get snippy and I get snarky and every argument that's going on, I am right about it. That's how, and I get demanding. And she would have sat here and told you, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and sometimes I have a hard time loving my family well. When I get treated as the odd one out or not always accepted for who I am, I tend to lash out or get defensive or completely withdraw from them. And although I love them dearly, I am constantly reminded that loving them well is hard work. And frankly, as much as I love all of y'all, I fall short as a pastor also. There are times when that phone call comes and I'm halfway on my 5K run and I'm like, just want to go to the hospital right now, please God. Let someone else do it. Or that new person that I have to meet with my introvert self, I can put that off forever. So if I struggle to love my family and all of you, and even myself, well, how on earth am I supposed to think about loving my enemy? The person I don't like, especially in the world we live in today, right? So full of division, good grief, when hate crime is on the rise, right? And where there are wars all over the place, and we think about the people who started them, and it's really hard to love. And we're in the middle of a political race and that division is so stark and I'm thinking, how can people vote for that other person, right? I don't know how they can stand it. When racism still thrives, right? When sexism is alive and well and so is transphobia and all the other things and the poor getting poorer, struggling to feed their own children. It's really hard to love the ones that we think cause these systems to maloperate. And I don't have an answer. I don't, because I know how much I struggle. So the only thing that I can come up with is that we have an example, and that example is Jesus. And the more we practice, like we read, we don't practice enough, we give up, right, in our prayer of confession, the hopefully the better we get and loving even those who get under our skin. Because if we can follow that Jesus that enacted and embodied God's love for us, that Jesus who was incarnated and took on our flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus that didn't mind touching the leper, that Jesus that didn't mind sitting at a well with a woman he was not supposed to sit with and give her comfort for her life that was falling apart and then sending her to be a witness. That Jesus who didn't mind to sit at tables with all those that society thought was deplorable and disposable. That Jesus who never condemned the woman who was brought to him for adultery when he asked you who have no sin cast the first stone. That Jesus whose body was beaten and spat on and then was crucified to heal our brokenness. To forgive us when we are really not all that lovable all the time. That Jesus who was willing to do all that so that we can have life, but more than that, to be reconciled to God and reconciled to others, that is all I can give you. Practice, practice practice. And then I think love is when we reach out to the family who is by the bedside of a loved one who is dying or in the hospital. What is love? Love is when I pick up the phone and call a friend that I haven't heard from in two months and I find it kind of strange. 
Love is when I bake cookies for those who are shut in and cannot come and enjoy fellowship with us anymore. Love is not just providing for people who are new arrivals in this country, but building relationships. Letting them know that there are people standing with them every step of this hard, new way that they're walking. Love is spending time with the person who is grieving long after all the family left and the funeral is long forgotten, but their hearts are still broken. It is forgiving others in the end, my friends, as God forgives us. And it is being kind to those who get on our very last nerve. And then also praying for those that we cannot begin to even stand. And we are the body of Christ, aren't we? And in a few moments here, we are all going to join at the table and we kind of partake in the bread and in the cup. And through that, we profess what we believe, don't we? We profess that Jesus did exactly what he did, that God so loved us that Jesus gave his life. And we come to the table to give thanks for that, but we also profess in doing so that we are all united in Christ through the Spirit. May we, as we come to this table today, think about who is not here and who we need to invite. Who do we need to love maybe a little better? And then may we be strengthened here to get the courage to reach out to those people who stand on those edges for each of us and show them that love that Christ has shown us, because that is immeasurable. May it be so.
My friends, we are here today because Jesus has called us strangers and friends, locals and visitors, believers and doubters, certain and the curious. It's always in mixed company that Jesus gathers and invites to his table where in bread and in the cup he meets us and through him we who are different are joined to each other. So come, not because you understand, but because you are understood. Come not because of how you feel, but because God has food for you. Come not because you deserve a place, but because Jesus invites you just as you are. So come to this table. This is the table of the Lord that we are all invited to. Can you pray with me? May God be with you. Beloved of God, lift up your hearts. Children of God, give thanks to the one who is our hope. Our God, truly, we always offer our thanks because when there was nothing but your love, you shaped all that is beautiful and good. And when there was nothing but your faith, you formed us from the dust and breathed spirit into our lungs. And then there was nothing but your hope. You called us to be your people, creator of all. But when we looked in the mirror which the world held before us, we saw only ourselves, our desires, our wisdom. We turned away from you, insisting on our own way, growing irritable and rebellious when you would not give in to us. Yet, you did not leave us in the grasp of sin and death, trusting that if we met you face to face, we would turn to you in joy. So today, believing that your word has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, we join our voices with those who now know you fully, offering our songs of grateful praise. Holy, 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 refuge and hope of the world, all creation resounds with your praise. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes with words of grace. Hosanna in the highest. Holy indeed are you, anchorage of our hearts, and blessed is Jesus Christ, graced word of joy. In the fullness of your hope came so the famine of our spirits might be fed. The faithful son of Joseph knew rejection, so we might find refuge in your kingdom. And the epitome of your love endured hate and terror that we need not fear death and sin. And while we can only dimly understand the mysteries of your faith and hope and love, we celebrate the one who came to reveal them to us. To us. Christ died so we might have faith. Christ rose so we might see hope. Christ will come again so we will be with you in love. The Holy Spirit, may the bread which is broken become the means of our healing. And may the cup which is poured become the fountain of our servanthood. Touch us with faith that we might believe your justice and peace are to be shared with all people. Fill us with hope so we could dare to bear the burdens of those around us. And grace us with your love so we could be the healing which the hurting and lonely world needs. We pray this as we hold before you, especially this day, this longing for a community where they can be real, a place to practice becoming who you made them to be. We ask for your grace to surround them. 
and for those who have been on the receiving end of unloving behavior, especially those who have been told to bear abuse in your name, we ask for your truth to set them free. We hold before you all those who were affected by the storms in the Midwest and in Texas, for those who are still trapped in Gaza, and all those affected by the war between Israel and Palestine, and those in Ukraine living in constant fear. When we are rescued from the bonds of time, when we find refuge with our sisters and brothers around the feast to prepare for us in glory, we will join our voices in singing to you our faith, our hope, our love forever. God in community, holy in one, as we all together pray the prayer that Jesus told us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, on the night that Jesus was arrested, when he was having a meal with his disciples in the upper room, he took the bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he poured the cup, saying to them, This is a cup of a new covenant poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins, for you and for many. Take and drink, and do this in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us all join in the feast. The body of Christ are broken for you. Take and eat.
nice chip for you. My friends, this is the blood of Christ shed for all of us. Take and drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please pray with me. Nourished in body by bread and juice, O oh God, may we strive for the nourishment of all bodies. May we work to end hunger in this creation that provides amply for all. Nourished in spirit by the body which is within our own, may we strive for the incooperation of all. May we work to break the barriers that divide us from one another and from you. And then the love that sustains us and the spirit that animates us, may we give all thanks and praise to you, O God of all. Amen. We have been called to speak and to live out the radical abiding love of God in the world. We do so by offering all that we are, all that we do, and all that we have, knowing that God will use us and our gifts to bring the beloved community ever closer to being realized in this world.
My friends, go forth celebrating faith. Go forth celebrating hope. Go forth celebrating love. Go forth to be transformed people that God calls us to be, and then go and transform the world. Most of all, go forth knowing that you are surrounded by God's love, God's presence, our steadfast rock and redeemer. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you all his everlasting peace. Amen. Amen.